herzlich willkommen hier im Haus der Kunst ähm, zum Vortrag Lines of Descent von Deepak Anand. Wir sind eine illustre kleine Gruppe. Ich halte mich auch versprochen ganz kurz. Mein Name ist Anna Schneider. Ich bin Kuratorin hier im Haus und zeichne zusammen mit Deepak Anand verantwortlich für die Ausstellung Wie waren Sundaram Umbrüche, die derzeit hier im Haus zu sehen ist. Es ist heute meine ehrenvolle Aufgabe, den heutigen Redner Deepak Anand vorzustellen. Deepak Anand lebt seit vielen Jahren in Paris und ist Kunstkritiker und Kurator. Er lehrt außerdem an der École des Beaux-Arts in Caen. Als Kurator hat er unter anderem Ausstellungen zeitgenössischer Kunst über die französische Malerei des 19. Jahrhunderts, die Fotografie des Surrealismus sowie über das Indienbild des Westens organisiert. Darüber hinaus gilt er als Experte für zeitgenössische indische Kunst. Er ist außerdem Autor zahlreicher Publikationen, unter anderem auch zu Vivan Sundaram, sowie dessen Tante der bedeutenden indischen Malerin Amrita Shergil und dessen Großvater, dem charismatischen Amateurfotografen Umrao Singh Shergil. Die außergewöhnliche künstlerische und kosmopolitische Familie wird auch das Thema des heutigen Abends sein. Denn die familiären Bindungen spielen auch im Werk von Vivan Sundaram eine wesentliche Rolle. Sie sind zwar nicht unmittelbar mit der Ausstellung verknüpft oder Fokus der Ausstellung, hier steht vor allem die Auseinandersetzung mit der Kunstgeschichte und auch sein politisches Selbstverständnis im Vordergrund. Dennoch stellen die Bezüge zu seiner Familiengeschichte einen faszinierenden Aspekt in Vivan Sundarams Werk dar, den wir Ihnen natürlich nicht vorenthalten möchten. Falls Sie also noch nicht die Gelegenheit gehabt haben, die Ausstellung Vivan Sundaram Umbrüche zu besuchen, darf ich Sie noch mal herzlich dazu einladen. Ich möchte Ihnen an dieser Stelle außerdem noch mitteilen, dass die Ausstellung bis zum 1. Januar 2019 verlängert wurde und Sie hoffentlich so noch ausgiebig Zeit haben, die Ausstellung zu besuchen. Zur weiteren Vertiefung der Thematik möchte ich Ihnen nochmal den Katalog ans Herz legen, in dem auch Deepak Anand natürlich einen der wesentlichen Essays geschrieben hat. Und an dieser Stelle möchte ich jetzt gleich auch das Wort übergeben an Deepak Anand. Ich würde Sie bitten, wir sind zwar eine kleine Gruppe, aber ich würde Sie bitten, falls Sie Fragen haben, diese bis zum Ende aufzuheben. Wir haben dann sicher noch die Gelegenheit ihn genauer zu den Themen befragen. Ich wünsche Ihnen jetzt einen anregenden Abend, viel Vergnügen und uh, please Deepak, uh, I turn over the mic to you. <lacht> please come up. Thank you Anna and thank you Andrea for inviting me. Um, um, I perfectly understand, I think we should do this talk outside in the garden because it's a beautiful day, but thank you for coming. Um, so. <clears throat> so when Andrea suggested a topic for this talk, she, she thought it'd be interesting not just to talk about Vivan Sundaram's work, but also uh, talk about two other figures in his family, uh, his aunt, who is a very important pioneering modern painter in India, and his grandfather, uh, who was an amateur photographer. And uh, so therefore this talk really talks, you know, is, will, uh, will, go, will cover these three important figures uh, in, in, you know, in, in the history of modern and contemporary art. Having said that, of course, Vivan Sundaram's work, although he has talked about, uh, he has visited his, 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 his grandfather's photographs, uh, um, there is no, I mean, his own work is obviously independent and it's of his time in the same way as his Amrita Shergil, his aunt, her work is also marks an important moment in the evolution of modern art. Uh, so the connections are, of course, of the family, but there are three sort of almost distinct bodies of work. So I, I've called this um, 
talk lines of descent, which obviously suggests a certain genealog genealogical aspect. Uh, uh, but I just, just don't mean that in, term, in familial terms, because uh, it's also a question of how, for example, Vivan Sundaram, who's really the focus of this show and, and, and the concluding, I mean, this third section of my talk, is also interested in the genealogy of his own formal uh, interventions, which obviously look at uh, uh, recent histories of modern art, of modernism, uh, especially from the 1960s onwards. So what I'm going to do basically is, I mean, I have, I mean, I have a lot of texts which I've written, I mean, occasions before on these three figures. So of course I'm not going to read them because I think some things, uh, that, not all things that are read, not all things that are written can be spoken. Uh, I think, but um, I will occasionally look at my text just in terms of remembering certain quotations. But otherwise, I mean, I'd be you know, talking about the, the images that I'll be showing you today. So. <clears throat> Hello. So, do I press? So, I, just as an introduction, I'm going to show you three images um, which introduce this, this, the three figures in question. And I must point out immediately that the first two images are actually photo montages, digital photo montages by Ivan Sundaram based on his grandfather's photographs. So what you see here is a juxtaposition of Amrita Shergil on the left, uh, the painter, and her father, Umrao Singh Shergil, uh, which I thought was interesting as a juxtaposition and also because it's Ivan Sundaram himself who has created this, this work. It's part of a series uh, which he did um, a few years ago, and it was, which was in fact shown at the Haus der Kunst in 2006 when Chris Durkin organized a show called An Artist Family from India, which included the three figures. Uh, but of course, in the show which I curated with Anna, uh, we didn't, there's no really autobiographical element in the show. It's more to do with Ivan Sundrum's sort of political engagements and socially uh, engaged work. Um, so this is an, an image which is therefore of the father and daughter. Um, and another image, again, uh, which shows uh, Amrita Shergil in Paris uh, with her father. And you can already see from these images how there's an element of uh, uh, self-fashioning, how there's an element of posing for the camera, uh, which of course here is, 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 is part of photo montage, I remind you. But, but when I'll show you individual images of Umrah Singh Shergil, you'll see that although he was an amateur, uh, there is a, a strange sense of staging himself as a photographic subject, uh, which is an interesting project when it was taken uh, at the time. So. <clears throat> and one other image, which is not a photo montage, but a photograph taken by Umrah Singh Shergil, showing himself with his grandson, that is Vivan Sundaram, uh, with this camera which Vivan cradles, uh, you know, and uh, again, you know, a kind of mise-en-scene, but charming because it suggests this kind of filiation uh, uh, between grandfather and grandson, uh, but also it suggests uh, the kind of, uh, I'd say, um, the kind of histories or histories which Vivan Sundram himself has explored, both in an autobiographical way, but also in a more impersonal register. So it seemed interesting to, to begin with these three images as a kind of sort of prelude uh, to what I'm going to now talk about. So I begin with Umrah Singh Shergil. Um, uh, and just to give you some information about uh, you know, his, some biographical information, um, it's that he was, you know, he was born in 1870 and he died in 1954. And he comes from this very aristocratic, landed um, class in, in, in northern India, in the Punjab, um, uh, important land-owning family. Uh, and I remember this is, uh, we are still in British colonial times. But what is interesting is that compared to other members of his family, Umrah Singh Shergil was rather sort of untypical because he was not interested in you know, looking up the lands and the usual sort of, you know, uh, uh, occupations of someone who, of, the, of his class, because he was a scholar in Sanskrit and Persian, 
um, and um, early on, uh, you know, adopted a kind of sort of he's rather sort of a kind of reclusiveness in, as as far as sort of the rest of the family was concerned. And so all his life, in fact, he sculpt he he pursued his own interests, which were really scholarly interests. Uh, um, so although he lived as part of this grand family, you know, he was really sort of someone rather uh, uh, marginal. You know, so. <clears throat> um, now. The thing about Umrah Singh Shergil is that he's a kind of freelancer in everything he does. I mean, quite apart from being very interested in ancient texts, in philosophy, he was also passionate about all kinds of things like carpentry, you know, all kinds of, he's a kind of bricoleur. I mean, he liked to sort of tinker with stuff and certainly with photography, and, you know, and so he was a kind of amateur photography, photographer, and I use the word amateur in the original sense of the word, because amateur, as Roland Barthes reminds us somewhere, comes from amateur, that is someone who loves and loves again, who wants to renew his pleasure. So in that sense, it's sort of, it's not a professional uh, interest that he has in photography, but merely something, and he, it was a, a kind of toy which he discovered, and of course, during, you know, we're talking about the late 18th, 19th century, which is precisely when photography becomes a kind of pastime or hobby for the leisure classes. And so Umrah Singh Shagir obviously is very much part of that kind of, uh, uh, you know, um, I mean, he, 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 once he discovered photography, of course, he, it became a kind of obsession with him. Now I show you very quickly various kinds of images um, to demonstrate how this self-taught photographer, because, you know, he doesn't sort of mention any other photographers, what kind of works he looked at, uh, and I think, and, it, and once, when one, is, one sort of knows from what he left behind, I mean, the huge archive, of, not just of phot photographs, but also of written material, that he looked at a lot of sort of manuals, you know, and uh, about technical manuals about how to take phot photographs, but, he, but you don't find any trace of other photographers who, you know, he might have been, have seen. So here, for example, you have uh, an image which is, of him in, you know, which is again a very sort of Victorian conceit because you can see that the image is framed by this vase-like form, a sort of very late, late Victorian sort of uh, uh, conceit. Uh, and if we didn't know it was an Indian photographer, that it was Umrah Singh Shergil who had taken the photograph, we might see it in a magazine uh, with the title, An Indian Gentleman in His Study. But in fact, it's him, you know, he himself who's, who's posed in this way. So I want to emphasize that the whole idea about posing for the camera, uh, however, I'd say artlessly or naively, in words commas, is very much part of his, uh, uh, his project. <clears throat> now, what makes it interesting also in terms of his family background is that although he was independent uh, uh, and had pursued his own philosophical interests, he at some stage, he was also, it, one, it was discovered later on, that he was in, had sympathies with uh, a group which was uh, fighting for Indian independence, but which was based in Berlin uh, between 1914 and 1917. And so when the British authorities discovered his links with this, uh, with this sort of what they would have assumed as terrorist, uh, uh, you know, when they discovered that, he was, of course, all his properties were confiscated. He was given a sort of very minor sort of, you know, income to live on. And had it not been for his family, of course, you know, he would have had, had, had an even more marginal life than he chose to have one. So, uh, so it's interesting also because he, compared to his family, he was a nationalist. And of course, I use the word nationalist not, in, not at all in the way it's used now. Because it's, a, it's a taboo word, rightly so, perhaps. But nationalism in the context of the colonial, anti-colonial movement where there was this whole move towards independence. So in that sense, of course, he was part of that, that élan, that movement, uh, which is very different from the rest of his family who were British loyalists. So I think it's interesting to mention all this background. You know, so, <clears throat> um, now, uh, I'll just show you other images uh, and some of them extravagant. So here you have Umrah Singh Shergil when he's still very young, 1904, this is when he was born, I remind you, in 1870, where he's taken a photograph of himself after the bath. And of course, you know, since he belonged to the Sikh community who let their hair grow, uh, this is, I mean, that uh, it's on one level a straightforward image of someone who's had a bath. You know, but, but what is interesting is that this kind of imagery 
harks back eventually to images of Venus and you know Venus Anadima and etc. Uh, washing her hair of you know the, all the sort of mythic uh, references which was the, which was then codified in 19th century academic painting. So it's interesting that you know he takes this pose. You know it's a very studied pose. You can see the towel which is posed on the chair etc. And the, just the, even the gesture of you know uh, uh, the hands and the hair. So there is an element of, I'd say, narcissism, uh, but it's a kind of playful narcissism, which I think comes from the amateur's desire to see himself as an image. I mean, I think uh, that's part of the whole sort of uh, charm uh, and playfulness when someone who's taking photographs of himself or of his family, just in partly to see how, it'll, how he or she or I would look in an, as an image, and I think this is part of it. Except, of course, that the staging here is rather, the iconography, so to speak, is rather extravagant. <clears throat> now, the, the, the change in the family, of course, comes when Umra Singh Shergil meets this Hungarian opera singer, or in any case, who trained as an opera singer uh, in India. She was part of an entourage of a princess uh, of the Punjab, and that's when he met her in Simla, which was the summer capital of the British in India, and they got married. And so uh, Marie Antoinette, uh, uh, as she was called, uh, you know, married this Indian aristocrat, rather sort of uh, eccentric Indian aristocrat. And so, uh, and being Hungarian, of course, they went to Budapest. And so there are a lot of images where you see this Indian sort of aristocrat making his way into the Central European high bourgeoisie. Uh, and so these images of the interiors are also, in a way, portraits, you know, they're portraits of an interior, portraits also of a certain class, you know, uh, uh, which is, I mean, there are lots of images like these, but I've chosen just a few uh, to give you, give you an idea about uh, this change in his, you know, uh, it happens when, when he marries this, this um, Hungarian, um, lady. Uh, so there are other image, images, again, which I think hark back to certain conventions of posing for, for painting, but also for photography, which Umrah Singh has assimilated. And of course, I mean, whole decor, I mean, the setting, everything, you know, gives you an idea about uh, uh, the kind of upholstered lives of a certain kind of European bourgeoisie. You know, so <clears throat> I mean, an image like this, of course, when you, I mean, you, when you think about fancy images in, in painting, you know, you have, you know, Bona, Villar, et cetera, et cetera, but it's sort of a very familiar trope of a woman looking in the mirror. Although, I must, the, the idea of the mirror is, is sort of a strangely fascinating object for Umbra Singh Shergil, I think partly because of the way it doubles the image. And there are other images, there are other photographs which I don't have here, which shows him experimenting with double exposure. Uh, of sort of trying to sort of you know uh, create uh, several images you know as a kind of uh, hybrid uh, image uh, you know so he's experimenting also with what photography can allow uh, without ever losing sight of either himself or his immediate entourage. In that sense, in a way reminiscent of Lartigue, you know, who basically spent his entire life taking photographs of himself and his family. Uh, I think in that sense, Umra Singh Shergir is also is the, the kind of photographer who wasn't really interested in, in casting his gaze beyond that very sort of intimate uh, and, and privileged family sphere. Uh, so I'm showing you other images when his two daughters were born. Amrita Shergir was born in 1913, and his, her sister Indira Vivan Sundaram's mother was born in 1914. They were born in Budapest, and because of the outbreak of the war, they, had, they were forced to remain in Budapest until about 1921. So the two girls, which you see here, you know, uh, uh, grew up speaking Hungarian as their mother tongue. You know, so. <clears throat> and so I, I'm skipping to, I mean, you know, various images because I'm, I'm not, you know, I can't, uh, given the kind of time constraints we have. But I just want to sh share with you the kind of sort of. Uh, uh, Gimel Tishkai feeling which is there in these images, you know, this very sort of fam you know, sweetness of an intimacy uh, which is uh, uh, very much part of, of this universe. Uh, and of course, Umrah Singh Shagil was, I think, uh, 
infatuated by his two daughters and certainly by Amrita Shagil. And as, he, as they grow older, I mean, he sort of becomes almost obsessed with Amrita Shagil as, as a photographic subject and so on. <clears throat> but you can see, I mean, it's interesting also in terms of the kind of dual heritage, Indian and European, which is at play in, the, in these works. You know, so. <clears throat> So I'm showing you other images. Um, this again was in Budapest. Uh, the maternal family, I mean, um, Raj Singh's, uh, Singh's uh, Marie Antoinette's family also came, had sort of a fair amount of intellectuals and one of them was a, was a quite no, well-known uh, Indologist. They lived in a building where one of whose previous occupants had been Bela Bartok, etc. So it's a very sort of, again, a very cultured milieu uh, in which uh, Umbra Singh Shergil found himself when he, when he spent time in, in, in Hungary, uh, when, he, when, when, you know, when, when the girls were born. So, <clears throat> so I'm showing you other images. Uh, it's interesting already, I mean, there is in Amitav Shergil's face this kind of sort of residual inwardness or melancholy, which become very much a kind of char 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 sorry, trait of her, of her character later on. It already seems to be nascent uh, uh, over here. <clears throat> uh, and it's also interesting because here you see Umrah Singh Shergil uh, in Indian dress. Uh, but there was a time when he had actually shaved his beard and, you know, and had short hair. Uh, as if he was also adap adapting another persona because he was in Europe, you know. But at some stage, there's this feeling that he needs to assert his sort of Indianness again. And so you have this sort of, you know, uh, interestingly, the way dress, you know, is, becomes a kind of signifier of, of, uh, of cultural uh, belonging. And also, I'd like, I'd add that Umra Singh was a very a great admirer of Tolstoy. And at some stage, he designed his whole appearance, including you know, wearing tunics of the kind Tolstoy wore, you know, uh, which I'm sure you're familiar with. Um, <clears throat> and I said, as I said earlier on, that he was also a serious sort of tinkerer. He liked to sort of, he liked to sort of play with objects. He liked to discover how things are made. And here we have a kind of a sort of uh, a sound studio which he set up uh, uh, in, in, in India, in Simla. And you can see Indira, um, the younger daughter, with these sort of strange contraptions which look like headphones. Uh, so, you know, his interests were very, he's also very, as I said, interested in carpentry. So he's really sort of someone who is on a different plane from his milieu in, 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 in India. And, but what is interesting is that each time he wants to sort of have himself photographed in this, in this guise, in this, in this, person, in, in this persona. And I think that's part of the whole idea that uh, a bricoleur or someone who likes to tinker with things, the pride he takes in being seen with the objects that he's manipulating. You know? So I think that's also part of it. <clears throat> and this again, when I said earlier on about the kind of sort of how he altern uh, you know, alternates between different kinds of uh, uh, vestimentary uh, uh, poses. This is like, I mean, as it says very self-consciously, uh, reclining on, on divan, self-portrait, uh, where you see him again striking a pose, uh, you know, uh, in this sort of, a kind of sort of oriental figure, you know, which if you, but what is interesting is that this kind of iconography is usually, you know, in the, in the European uh, masculine fantasy is centered on the female body. I mean, if you just have to think about Matisse in his sort of orientalist phase in the 1920s, where he dresses up these niçoises as, uh, you know, uh, odalisque. Uh, but so that kind of iconography one is familiar with, but here, strangely enough, it's, 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 it's a masculine presence, I mean, and who's photographing himself. So there's strange kinds of intela, you know, uh, connections and strange kinds of sort of um, uh, meanings at play. Uh, but I, but I, I'm not for a moment suggesting that, you know, uh, uh, that this was, uh, there's, there's any kind of gender play here. It's just basically someone who just loved himself, photographing himself in different ways, in different, in different avatars, so to speak. And so on. Like, for example, here, the Tolstoy image comes back, you know. But Umrah Singh Shergil had the wit 
uh, to also write behind some of his photographs about how ponderous or pretentious he was being when he titled these works. So, you know, so it's not naive in that sense. You know, he, he was obviously enamored of certain things, like Tol of Tolstoy, for example, and posed himself as some kind of melancholy, scholarly figure, you know, reclusive, etc. But very often he also is you know, aware, uh, he's being ironic about what he's posing as. You know, so. Like here, for example, with you know, self-portrait in his study in 1933. This is all back in Simla, you know, when, they, when the family returned to India. Um, and you have to obviously imagine that he has a concealed um, you know, um, shutter, which he, you know, it, it's an, it, it wasn't an easy thing as, as, you know, to, to pose for a camera given, given the state of technology at, at the time. But, um, but it's remarkable how you know, there's, these are kind of sort of portraits of uh, someone who is um, experimenting with what it means to be um, a self, what it means to be a person, a projection of what, you're, you, know, what you want to be. Um, and this is again kind of an extraordinary image which was taken in Paris um, because the family moved to Paris when Amrita Shergill was admitted to the Ecole des Beaux-Arts um, in 1929 and um, at the age of 17, and therefore the whole family moved to Paris. Her sister, Indira, uh, was uh, enrolled at the Ecole Normale de Musique, which was run by the great Alfred Cortot, um, pianist. And so this is when the family moved to these rather beautiful apartments in, in the 16 arrondissement. And when the, children, when the girls were not at home, Umrah Singh obviously turned attention to himself as a subject. And so here you have this extraordinary photograph, in fact it's a diptych, uh, which says photographs taken at the interval of 15 days when he was fasting, and what he looked like before and after. So, so. And, but you, you realize how the pose again recalls, you know, a kind of what the French call an academie, you know, when in, in the at the Ecole des Beaux-Arts when you copy after the model. It, it's, same, it's, an, it's a pose which is almost similar to that kind of, uh, iconography. <clears throat> I go on, I'm jumping now from to, to a much later photograph back in India uh, when he's older and trying to sort of heat a kettle but again uh, all these contraptions around him, there's a radio, there's uh, you know but again you know you can see that sort of the wire you know which is again would obviously trigger the shutter or the image etc. But uh, this kind of sort of uh, self-centeredness, you know, uh, which is a, a singular trait of his of his work. <clears throat> and this is the beautiful image. Uh, you know, again, he was very interested in this astronomy, and this is Umrah Singh Shergill as a stargazer. <clears throat> and of course, the images of Amrita Shergill. This is in Paris, in this sort of Parisian chic, uh, which. Again, another image of her, this time in a bathing suit in, in, in the apartment. Uh, and Amita Shergill, uh, one of the first paintings she did when she was at the Ecole des Beaux-Arts, again in this apartment in, in, in the 16th district in Paris. And uh, a double portrait of the two sisters. And I want to juxtapose that with image, an image of Amrita Shergill taken when she decides to come back to India after having finished her studies, and when she decides very self-consciously to stop wearing Western dress and to wear saris and Indian dress, and Indian jewelry, Indian costumes, etc., uh, as a way of asserting her identity. Because the thing about Amrita Shergill, which I'll come to in a minute when I, when I talk about her work, is that uh, given, uh, given her very European background in the early years, uh, she really discovers India and uh, in, a more, in a more mature spirit much later, uh, which is also when she discovers th that part of herself, which is Indian, which she doesn't really, you know, hasn't really explored or identified with. And so one of the conscious decisions when she, when she comes back to India is precisely to sort of adopt this Indian persona. And this is one of the images that of her, which uh, Umrah Singh took, uh, of her precisely in a sari, looking itself in a mirror. There's a kind of narcissistic streak which is bequeathed from father to daughter, uh, because of course Amrita Shaigal was very beautiful. Uh, and um, 
the kind of complicity between the sitter and the, and the photographer is rather striking. I mean, uh, the, the, it's a strange sort of relation of father and daughter where the, the daughter actually assumes, again, various kinds of persona. This is a very beautiful portrait of Amrita Shergill of 1935 when she was fully in India. And I can, you can see, you know, uh, the kind of sort of rather grave, melancholy aspect of her face, uh, which increasingly asserts itself uh, in these years. I come to that when I talk about her work uh, in a minute, but <clears throat> uh, I just want to also show you uh, as a kind of contrast with the kinds of images of interiors earlier on, you know, either in India or in Hungary, this kind of very opulent, ornate uh, interiors covered with, you know, uh, upholstered in every way. And how when Amrita Shagil comes back to India, she designs this studio for herself, which is very sort of modern style, you know, uh, it's very sort of art deco. And everything, you know, from the carpet to the lamps to the furniture were designed by her. You know, so as a kind of contrast between how the kind of, the idea of the modern for Amita Shergill was not only in terms of what she wanted to do as a painter, but also in terms of, uh, she wanted to sort of disburden herself of the kind of sort of, uh, uh, all the bourgeois trappings, you know, which she'd brought up in. So. <clears throat> this is probably one of the last images of Amrita Shergill taken by her father, because 1941 is the year when she died. Uh, um, and this is, again, a rather pensive, uh, inward-looking image, uh, a very sort of abstracted, obviously she's elsewhere, a rather sort of, uh, yeah, melancholy image again. Um, um, of, of Amrita Shagel. <clears throat> I just want to sort of, in terms of giving you other references, of course, Umrah Singh Shagel is, although he doesn't talk about any other photographers, he's hardly sort of uh, uh, unique in the kind of work he did, because if you think of people like, of writers, for example, who turned to photography, and writers who took, uh, when it went, and who turned to photography, but also took themselves as subjects, you can think of Strindberg, for example, you can think of Zola, you can think of Robert de Montesquieu, uh, uh, among many others, you know, uh, who, uh, who once they discovered the, the camera as a kind of sort of toy, were predominantly interested in taking photographs from themselves and their families. But of course, Umrah Singh, Sh 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 I mean, wasn't really aware of all this, but I'm just trying to bring this up to suggest that it's, it's not, he's not just some kind of solitary figure. I mean, there are other, others of his kind you know, who, who were interested in similar, uh, I'd say, had similar interests. So, this is again uh, one of the rare images we have uh, of Amita Shergill at work, uh, turning away from her easel. Uh, again, taken by her father, and it provides me with this sort of uh, um, uh, transition to her work. But I just want to read one little uh, section, which I think gives you a sense of why this photography is important, not just as the expression of someone who's an amateur, because in fact, I think the word amateur, which I said I used in its, its sort of uh, etymological sense of amateur, or someone who does something out of love, uh, who wants to renew his pleasure. But in fact, when you look at the whole corpus of his photography, you can perhaps consider Umrah Singh Shergill as a kind of one of the first authors uh, in, in, in the history of photography, uh, because the way his images chronicle of um, uh, an important and crucial phase in Indian history, which is to say the passage from the colonial, colonial period to independence. I mean, his photographs are not explicitly about this subject, but, I mean, the, but, the, but what he chose to photograph are, do uh, offer this, a kind of chronicle, certainly in an autobiographical way, but a chronicle nevertheless. They form part of an archive of modernity at large. And I think that's what's, uh, you know, that's how one can finally uh, situate his, his work. Because it shows that uh, however much he might have been an amateur, uh, the work of agency, the work of one to will, you know, a kind of uh, image of oneself, and that uh, of sort of a, a, a project of self-fashioning, which I think is a very modern project. Uh, and in that sense, of course, you know, his work is part of a certain archive of, of, of modernity. <clears throat> What am I doing for time? Am I okay? <laughs>
Okay, now so Amrita Shergill, of course, is, is a painter, I mean, not a band writer at all. Uh, and um, she was very precocious because only when she was a child she was making you know, watercolors, drawings, etc., encouraged in this by her mother. And when she, uh, at some stage, when um, Marie Antoinette, her mother, decided that it was time for these gifts to be finessed by proper art schooling, which is when they first went to Florence and then, then Amrita Shagel was admitted to the Ecole des Beaux-Arts at the age of 16, I think, uh, uh, which was very young. Uh, so I'm going to show you quick, very quickly the kinds of images, paintings she did when she was in Paris in the 19, early 1930s to show that basically what the Ecole, what she got from the Ecole de Beaux-Arts was, uh, was a language, I mean, which is, of course, an academic language, uh, but which then served her finally to, to dis dispense with it later on when she decided to really find herself as a painter. But I'm showing you sort of very quickly the kind of academic paintings she did. When I say academic, I'm not necessarily being pejorative. It's just that, for example, this painting won the first prize at the, at the Salon in Paris in 1932. You know, uh, which is already a kind of sort of obviously a very important thing for a young Indian artist, I mean, a young artist to, go, to, to, to get a prize like this at the time. But it shows you a kind of conventional conversation piece, a kind of genre which is more, you know, uh, popular in England rather than, than in France. It shows that two figures, the figure on the left is Amrita, uh, Indira Shergil, her sister, talking to a friend. Uh, and I think there's an image, yes taken by Umrah Singh of this uh, painting session uh, uh, where you see, of course, Amrita you know, standing and, and the two figures who are posing for this painting. Um, so it's very much, again, you know, part of a whole convention what, which one is familiar with in the history of art where you're drawing from the model, uh, we're painting from the model. Uh, as, for example, also, I mean, what she painted really was still life, nudes, or figures, you know. So you have uh, this reclining nude from 1933. I, must, I might add in passing that, of course, this kind of work has some links with a kind of revival of realism in the interwar periods between the 19, you know, uh, when there's a kind of return to, to the figure uh, and, a, and a, a renewed interest in realism. But what is really curious about Amrita Shaggy, because she's very outspoken in what she liked, what she admired, but she never really mentions the, the painters whom really mattered for her. I mean, if you think that you, there's Picasso, there's Matisse, I mean, etc., etc., she really barely ever mentions them, except in one emblematic uh, quotation, which I'll give you uh, in a minute. Uh, but uh, so it's sort of, but then we can deduce when you look at paintings of the period that this is very much part of this revival of, uh, of this, this sort of new interest in, in a kind of figurative painting, which is um, perhaps less interested in extending uh, the formal language. Uh, I, mean, I mean, if you think about what Picasso does to the human figure, or what Matisse did even in 1916, 1917. And then you have this rather sort of, you know, uh, accomplished but um, it, uh, image, but which doesn't seem to take into consideration the kinds of uh, disfigurations, the kind of violence done to the image, you know, which we, which what we identify as modern art, or what is modern in modern art. Uh, but they're very sort of accomplished. For example, this is a, photo, uh, a painting of, um, of Boris Dadzlitsky, who was uh, uh, a fellow student at the Ecole des Beaux-Arts, uh, uh, who then became a very engaged realist painter with communist sympathies, and who happened to be also Amrita Shegel's lover at the time. Uh, but this kind of image harks back, obviously, in its iconography to Cezanne. You know, uh, uh, <clears throat> And, but there is this gradual shift uh, from around 1933 30 onwards. This is a painting called Nude, or sorry, Sleep, uh, sometimes called Nude, but Sleep is the, is, is the right title. And this is her sister Indira who posed for this image. Now what is striking about this image is given the kind of plunging view uh, of this figure, and also uh, this rather sort of uh, strange detail of this dragon which echoes the silhouette, the curves of, the, of, the, of this reclining, sleeping body, uh, etc. Uh, so it is sort of, there's a kind of sort of uh, strange eroticism which is insinuated uh, in this image, uh, which is interesting. 
as is, for example, the color of the skin. Uh, you know, um, and I mention that uniquely because this is the moment when Amrita Shagil begins to be interested in Gauguin. The Gauguin who is, you know, for her, is important because he's the one to uh, sort of propose, uh, to depict, to represent the non-European body, you know, so, uh, which is why this painting is a kind of sort of, um, a kind of, um, it's, 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 it signals some, a new departure uh, in her work. <clears throat> and of course, that sort of uh, departure comes to a head in this painting called uh, Self-Portrait as Tahitian, uh, where obviously the reference to Goga is, is, obvious, very, is, is clear. Uh, she's referring to Gauguin's images of you know, the paintings he did in Polynesia. Um, and this was a way for her to sort of um, interrogate the possibilities of how to represent the non-European body, you know, and given the fact that she herself was uh, Eurasian, half Indian and half European. So it's very interesting and also I think very intelligent uh, and a very sort of uh, self-conscious uh, 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 idea the title as well as the image to, to call it self portrait as Tahitian because it suggests, you know, where her painting, what kind of direction her painting wants to take or what she wants to take. Now, before this, before I go on to talk about this, I want to give you a quotation from Amita Shagil. She says in 1938, um, Europe belongs to Picasso, Matisse, and Braque, and many others. India belongs only to me. Uh, and this, this is when she was 25 years old. So you can see that when, she, when her art school training finishes in, in, in Paris, she makes this conscious decision that the only place she could find herself as an artist was to, would be to return to India. And in fact, as purely as an anecdote, for example, or biographical detail, her parents didn't want her to come back to India because Amita Shergill was a very a sort of emancipated person for her age. And when she was in Paris, of course, uh, as all her fellow students were in love with her. And of course, her parents thought that coming back to India, she would certainly not fit in, or you know, the kind of circles they moved in. And so there are letters, correspondence between her and her father, and to say that the reason she wants to go back to India is because she wants to discover what her real culture is, you know, uh, which is what she undertakes when she returns. So, uh, so you have here someone who is extremely sort of, I mean, when you read her letters as well, uh, very forthright, very, who has thought through a lot of things, and the whole idea about identity, in her case, would be, I'd say, a kind of colonial identity in formation, I mean, how, to, and, you know, uh, uh, about being neither Europe fully Indian nor fully European. All that is posed in her work, and certainly in a painting called Cell Portrait as uh, Tahitian. So anyway, so when she comes, and what's also interesting, so this is, for example, a painting called Nude Group of 35, and this is already when she's back in India, what is interesting is that Goga becomes important for her once she returns to India, but not while she's in Europe. It's as if that model was important for her, became, becomes important for her as a kind of way, of, uh, as a new kind of paradigm for exploring the non-European body, but not in Europe, but in, but, in, but in India. So here, for example, this is a group of three, I'm sorry for this poor image, but you can see the Goga influence, among other things, the way the palm rests on, on, on this, on this um, on you know in, in uh, elevation, uh, the kind of sort of generic uh, resemblance of the three figures in terms of their facial expressions, which is again a, a, a Goga uh, trope. Uh, let me show you other works, like for example in Group of Three Girls, again where the interest in Goga is is manifest. I mean, if you look at Gauguin's Tahitian works, for example, I mean, the faces are more or less interchangeable uh, because it, he's referring to some kind of generic Tahitian person. And in the same way, I think over here, uh, these might be well, they might well be sisters, but there is a kind of, that kind of sort of uh, uh, resemblance, you know, which makes them fairly interchangeable. But what is interesting really here is how, you know, uh, obviously the subject matter is Indian, uh, I must remind you that when she comes back to India, the people she decides to paint are basically people who worked for her family, you know, on their huge estate. Um, and uh, there's a very nice quotation which I could try and find you, where she says, uh, um,
basically when she says that what interests her are, are to paint the poor people of, uh, whom she sees around her, whom she sees as desolate and with a strange, and she mentions the word melancholy as well when she describes them. I should probably find it at some stage. But, um, uh, which is again in contrast to um, the kind of milieu in which she was brought up in, you know. Um, so um, I now show you some, some of the works which are really important transitional works. This is the time when Amrita Shegil is discovering Indian art, I mean classical Indian art and certainly classical Indian sculpture. And so you see these rather sort of monumental figures, um, they're called hill men and the pendant called hill women. And of course here one can sort of sense the kind of hinting allusion to sort of Picasso's uh, slightly mannered, melancholy figures in the, in the blue period, for example. Um, but this is a new direction for her work, um, the way sort of, you know, the, the clothing, for example, is, is creates this sort of mass uh, uh, where uh, to sort of create a certain sort of uh, monumental effect in the same way as Hill Women, uh, which is a pendant to this, to this painting. <clears throat> And she also undertakes to take what, what would, you know, it's almost like some kind of grand tour of India, precisely to, to, to sort of visit all the sort of famous ancient sites. She goes to Ajanta, Elora, you know, these famous uh, cave, the cave paintings in Ajanta, but also the fantastic sculptures in these grotto-like spaces in, in Elora. And she's absolutely sort of, you know, that's a kind of sort of, uh, it changes her vision of things. And, and so the paintings she's doing at this time uh, are all, you know, culled from what she sees, you know, uh, around her. But I must also remind you, of course, that these are people who posed for her. You know, often they were sort of in this extended sort of entourage of servants and, and you know, uh, um, domestics uh, who work for the family who were made to take these poses. And she, you know, uh, but, but they, they, they translate her attempt to. Uh, arrive at a specifically, uh, I'd say, uh, something which is unique to her. She s declares that her ambition was to be the first truly modern Indian painter. Uh, and of course, you know, she was scornful about whatever she saw in India because she thought it was academic. Uh, so these are works, you know, which she did during her tour of South India. Uh, and you can sense what she learned from the frescoes in Ajanta. I'm, I'm sorry, I don't have an image to show you of those frescoes, but the kind of sort of tonal modeling, which which is almost you know, uh, you know, it's sort of it's very very nuanced. I mean, the, you know, uh, the the way the figures emerge and seem to recede, uh, which is a, a trait characteristic of, of of mural painting in Ajanta, certainly. Uh, how she's trying to develop a kind of body type. Uh, to represent uh, uh, the Indian sh that she sees. And this is probably one of her key major paintings of this period, Brahmacharis, which you could translate as sort of uh, novice uh, priests, uh, which is very much sort of uh, translates what, sh you know, her, her, what she's learned from fresco painting in India. Uh, the way, I mean, the very subtle modulations of these browns, you know, uh, uh, which contrasts vividly with, with the whites of the of these of the of the of these dhotis. Um, so this is the kind of painting which you know which is looking at Indian sculpture, Indian um, very, very ancient Indian fresco paintings uh, to evolve a very modern language. You know? um, uh, so with obviously with somewhere in mind Goga in mind, but the Goga reference has now been transmuted into something else. So as again in this work called Bride's Toilet. <clears throat> um, the whole challenge from Rita Shegel at this stage is to how to uh, uh, translate uh, chromatically what she's seeing you know, in India. Uh, um, and very soon when she turns her attention to Indian miniatures, whose principal characteristic, of course, is the, how they're suffused with color, their jewel-like colors. That'll again, that'll be an, another turn in her, in her evolution uh, as an artist. <clears throat> the storyteller of 1937. 
So I, I think, I suppose you can, you can sense how, why Gauguin was so important for her towards finding her, her own sort of way, language, her own vision, because it was a kind of, a kind of self-styled exile living in, in, in Polynesia, who's rejecting European civilization and trying to sort of, uh, uh, of course, that again is a projection on the part of Gauguin, uh, uh, because Tahiti had all other kinds of problems, but the whole kind of idyll imagined by Gauguin filters its, its way into Amitya Shagel's consciousness uh, in a different way, certainly in terms of ways of how to represent the native body, the indigenous body. And so, but when she turns her attention to Indian miniatures, for example, the formats of the works are much smaller, they're more jewel-like. This is a work called Siesta, uh, rather dark image, I'm afraid, but it, the reds in the original are rather glowing and beautiful. Um, she is sort of also adapting a certain kind of iconography which you find in Indian miniatures, which is all about erotic yearning or longing. Uh, and she's also translating the kinds of cloistered, secluded lives of Indian women in this huge family estate. I mean, I'm talking about people who worked for the family. Uh, and she was interested in giving that a voice or a place in her paintings. Uh, uh, therefore, you have lots of paintings which show these women with their, you know, occupied with their daily tasks, but with a kind of residual sense of loneliness or melancholy. Now, I want to just juxtapose that with something very different, because in 1938, Amita Shegel went back to Budapest to marry her cousin. Uh, and I mean, I don't have time to go into details about why she married her cousin, but uh, her cousin was a doctor and was aware of Amita Shegel's very liberated and emancipated lifestyle, both in Paris and when she's back in India, and was happy, to, was not bothered by it. And I think she probably liked him in some way, but... Uh, Anyway, so she married him, she went to Hungary to marry him, so when she was in Hungary, uh, an old interest of hers comes back to her, an old pictorial interest, which is to say Bruegel. And so some of the scenes she painted there in Hungary, you can see how she is now very deftly moving from uh, this kind of very Indian work that she did in India, and remembering her roots also in a Western academic style, although this painting is not at all academic, it's, it's sort of paying tribute to something, to, to, to a master like, like Bruegel. Uh, show you another work, Potato Peeler, 1938, which obviously contrasts with what the work she did uh, in India. But the striking image of this period is certainly this work called Two Girls of 1939. It was painted in Budapest, but it juxtaposes two female figures, you know, dark-skinned figure with a lighter-skinned figure, which obviously reads as some kind of allegory of the, her own divided self of, you know, being half Indian and half European. Of course, the iconography of the work harks back to, this is a standard theme in painting in, certainly in France, of two women posed together, usually meant by the name of Les Deux Amis, with sort of sapphic undertones. So we don't know what, what, what the real meaning of this work is, except that it's a very striking and accomplished work. And you can see the kind of modernist simplifications at work here, uh, which shows that you know, she's gone way beyond the kind of sort of, uh, uh, in retrospect, conventional painting that earned her a gold medal at the Salon in 1933, uh, when she was at the Ecole des But when she's back in India again, you, you know, there's this reversal. I just want to juxtapose these two images to, tell, to show that how she is here heading towards a rather sensual and voluptuous kind of imagery in these works, again inspired by miniature, uh, Indian miniature paintings, but transforming it, uh, you know, the same way as when Picasso or certainly when Matisse looks at Oriental art, he transposes it into something else. So in that sense, it's not, I'm not talking about influence here, but more in terms of how a painter you know, takes something from another tradition, in this case, partly her own, and then transposes it in terms of a more modernist language, which is also part of her heritage. So very quickly about other images of Mitter Shegel, 1940, a year before she died. Uh, and this last unfinished painting of 1941, uh, which is very audacious because she's is almost sort of going towards a, a kind of abstraction. It's not an abstract painting, but it shows a street, a, a building, a house in red. The black figures are buffaloes on this narrow street. 
uh, it's an unfinished painting, but you can see how there's this uh, uh, ten, ten, um, this sort of uh, move towards something which is much more abbreviated, simplified, much more economical in its depiction, uh, which is again a very sort of modernist thing, modernist uh, characteristic. But this was her uh, last unfinished painting. I mean, she died at the age of 28. The, by this time, she and her husband had moved to Lahore, which was at the time in, I mean, now in Pakistan. But Lahore was a very cosmopolitan city, and she felt that, you know, that, that, that cosmopolitanism was, was more to her taste and that she was languishing, you know, in, in this provincial family estate or in Simla, which is also the British capital of India. Uh, and a, 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 a major exhibition was planned. Uh, but she died almost a month before that exhibition opened. Uh, again, of, of very mysterious reasons, which never been solved. Even mysterious because her, her husband was a doctor and he was there when she was dying. So, and the family discovered that she that she was dead when they, you know, and it was too late to do anything. But, so anyway, that's that is the kind of figure she was, uh, and the kind of obviously her, her early death has sort of made her into kind of, some kind of legend, but not just legend in terms of her persona, uh, what she was uh, as a you know uh, as of this very emancipated woman in colonial India. But certainly in terms of the way she uh, was probably the first Indian modern painter that she really wanted to be. I mean, she was on the threshold of being a really important major painter, but that, that promise was unfulfilled. <clears throat> okay, so now I move to Vivan Sundaram, but I was just wanted to tell you Concluding remark, which I thought I'd like to read out to you. The one painter whom Amrita Shagil, when she was in India, uh, admired. And in fact, he was really also a kind of amateur painter, was Tagore, who's more known, obviously, as, as a famous poet, the winner of the Nobel Prize uh, for literature. Uh, but Tagore, late in life, turned to painting, uh, which became a kind of obsession with him, uh, to the degree that he, in fact, almost left writing for, for, a, for a long moment. And I think partly that is because the kind of vicissitudes or difficulties that he'd encountered in his translations, some of them done by himself, whereas he felt that painting was a medium which escaped translation. But so Amrita Shegil, when she discovers his work when she's back in India, she single, singles him out as someone who is, has something really sort of, uh, has some kind of inner uh, radiance in his work, uh, which again shows that she was very astute and sharp uh, and perceptive about, about, about uh, what she liked and, and quite rightly was proved to be, I mean, in terms of her judgments, uh, still proved to be sound. But I bring up to go only because as to juxtapose with Amrita Shergill as two figures who incarnate a certain idea about modernity and about, about the modern. And for example, when you think of this famous play by Tagore called The Home and the World, uh, the two, the two, I mean, the home and the world, I think it's something which can also use to describe the, the kind of sort of trajectories between here and elsewhere, uh, which characterized uh, uh, Amrita Shegel's uh, brief but radiant uh, life as, as a painter. <clears throat> so when I come to Vivan Sundaram, uh, of course, he never knew his aunt because um, she died in 1941 and Vivan Sundaram was born in 1943. Um, but, um, so, and I said, as I said earlier on in my, in, at the beginning of this talk, there's no real connection between what his, his Amita Shegel's work and her nephew's work, except when at some stage he decides to revisit uh, his grandfather's photographs to create a kind of counter archive or to reposition these photographs in a different narrative. Uh, uh, but, but obviously his concerns, 
are very different from you know his, his aunts. And so uh, it, the reason here he's here obviously is he's part of the same same family. But I want to begin by suggesting how uh, Vivan Sundaram also begins uh, his career as an artist, as a painter. And of course, these are works which are, which are I'm showing, showing you works which are all in, in the exhibition here. Um, and I think one of the greatest surprises of this exhibition, and not just for people viewing the show, but even for him, Vivan himself, are these five paintings. There are more, but we just showed five over here. Uh, which he did in 1968 and which he thought had been lost forever and they were discovered in someone's attic, in some proverbial attic uh, in London and miraculously, I mean, when they were sort of obviously rolled up and not taken care of, but it's astonishing how they retain their freshness, the sort of the, 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 of, the, of, the, of, the of their, of their, of their hues, but also in terms of, I mean, they've been marvelously restored. But, uh, what is interesting is that how Vivan Sundaram, his earliest work, is are, are, are these paintings. Uh, he was at the Slade School of Art uh, in London, graduating in 1968, which is obviously the most, one of the most emblematic dates in the second half of the century, given all the student revolts and revolts generally worldwide. Um, but this is the moment when there's a kind of dawning political consciousness uh, for Vivan as a student in London. But what these paintings are interestingly reveal as well are the kind of sort of uh, uh, painting which was, you know, which was very prevalent in London, uh, sort of pop-inspired uh, uh, works, which certainly in Vivan Sundram's case uh, uh, betoken a kind of collage aesthetic. In fact, I think. The, the four key words, if, uh, so to speak, which would define the way he's evolved, or which are important for his 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 evolution, are uh, I'd say a collage, montage, assemblage, assemblage, or, and bricolage. Uh, I mean, they seem to rhyme, but uh, as words, but in fact, they denote the kinds of uh, the ways in which he starts off as a painter, very much interested in the collage aesthetic. You can see in a work like this, for example, which is called from Persian miniatures to Stan Brakaj. Stan Brakaj being, of course, this avant-garde filmmaker, uh, very much interested in exploring the purely abstract qualities of color, but in film as a medium. Um, uh, Vivan Sundaram, when he's in London, has also develops um, sort of his a kind of cinephilia. I mean, he's a kind of great lover of cinema. So when I say collage as a pictorial uh, device, we can I'll show you other images. It's also what he's gleaned from montage, from the cinematic language. And the two come together in these sets of paintings, all made in 1968. Uh, you have here a work called Interior. Now the whole thing over here is how the modernist picture, the late modernist picture is put together in a way where uh, the content or the subject matter, so to speak, is rather elliptical, how it sort of coexists with elements which are purely sort of read as decorative elements. And I think this whole kind of pic the picture as a kind of puzzle, as a kind of sort of conundrum, uh, visual conundrum, is very much part of that kind of late modernist way of constructing a picture. I just want to remind you, for example, what Clement Greenberg said at the time. Uh, he makes a distinction between picturing which for him is merely representation, and picture making, which is much more important for a formalist like Greenberg, picture making meaning how a picture is put together, uh, that is to say the form of it rather than any meaning that one might give to it. And I think Vivan Sundaram's work from this moment onwards until now has always been interested in exploring the tension between, you know, between representation and abstraction or between I mean, the old uh, trope of form and meaning uh, between picturing something and, and picture making. I mean, with, with these early paintings, I think, encapsulate marvelously. <clears throat> I mean, a painting like Split, which would seem to sort of foreground the kind of disjunctures, which incidentally also the, is the title of this exhibition here, uh, the kind of sort of disconnections, uh, which then, uh, which are sort of as a kind of critical strategy, which uh, are at work in his work, you know, in generally, but here, um, you know, have been sort of even announced as a, as a title. Um, I mean, obviously, you may, you make out figurative elements, a garden, a tree, etc., but they're all, you know, part of this sort of uh, uh, 
very a kind of visual shorthand, you know, for uh, for creating uh, a, a, a tableau. Uh, a work called South Africa, 1968, again, is obviously referring to apartheid at the time in, in this country, etc. And kind of disjunction uh, between the two parts is also, again, another kind of uh, uh, way of, uh, uh, I'd say, uh, rupturing, you know, any, any easy reading of, uh, of, of the work. <coughs> And of course, May 68, uh, the title of this work, referring to May 68. You can see, for example, you know, these stripes, these, figure, these stripes which look like abstract elements could potentially refer to the barricades in Paris, just as, for example, the um, uh, red shape here against this white sort of head-like uh, form suggest a, a sickle, you know, hammer and sickle, etc. I mean, Bivan Sundram has always been interested in, he's not at all a formless in the sense of exploring form for its own sake. He's always been interested in, in uh, how meanings are created or how meanings uh, can be suggested. Um, and therefore, you know, he's already in these works a kind of allegorist in the making. I mean, he's interested in allegory as uh, a form of uh, um, uh, narrative which encodes various level, levels of meaning. <clears throat> now, I make, I make this really sort of uh, jump cut, to use the cinematic term, to come to, from 1968 to 2014, this is the installation which you see in the Haus der Kunst here, uh, which occupies one of the the largest rooms upstairs. And I wanted to juxtapose this, as I do also in, in the text in my, catalog, in my catalog essay, just to suggest uh, how, you know, the kind of sort of modernist, uh, uh, a very modernist way of uh, putting a picture together, uh, almost abstract in many ways, how that finds a strange echo in this sort of marble slab here uh, which is a kind of centerpiece of this installation. Uh, it sort of shows a very abstracted and, uh, you know, the, the basically black lines on a, back, on a white ground, uh, and, and it's obviously referring to kind of generic uh, abstraction, certainly gene a kind of generic Russian abstraction, um, to suggest how progressively, and certainly in, in this installation, Vivan Sundaram comes to sort of... Uh, uh, breaks out of the pictorial field and goes into what has obviously been known as installation art from the last 20, 35 years. But Vivan Sutum didn't want to plunge into this, this new mode, into, in, in this post-medium condition, uh, uh, without actually being a kind of profound reason for it. And of course, as it turns out, uh, his first foray into installation art is also coincides with a very sort of dark moment in Indian, recent Indian history. That was in 1993 when uh, there were these, this pogrom where thousands and thousands of Muslims were killed uh, by extreme right-wing Hindu militants. Uh, and how this work called Memorial is a kind of homage to an anonymous subject, uh, a photograph of a dead man on the street, uh, became sort of the starting point. Uh, as first of all a kind of commemoration of someone you know who was shot down on the street, but also, in a way, a, a way of, also a form of revisiting a certain recent past of, of, of the, in, in the history of art, um, beginning with some of its sort of emblematic forms, such as the abstraction which you see here. So when I said earlier on that he's an allegorical artist who's interested in. In, uh, in, in the play of meanings and how very often meanings are uh, coded or encoded or need to be deciphered. I mean, this, is a very, this installation is a very good case study almost of, of this process because they resemble, for example, superficially certain you know, emblematic forms like, for example, in the foreground, this barrier over here refers to a kind of generic minimalist sculpture, but of course it's also a barrier of the kind that was put up on the streets when these riots took place. Just as in the same way, you see this pathway leading up to this, 
you know, the central uh, element in the installation, uh, which is made of sandstone squares on the floor. And again, they are referring to also Carl Andre, Carl Andre's floor pieces, uh, etc. So this whole installation has double or triple meanings, and, and what Vivan Sundrum is interested in is to recode um, uh, these formal tropes which have come down to us from the recent past, uh, recently modern, uh, past of, in, of, of, of modernism, uh, to give them new meanings or to reconfigure them uh, differently. I mean, of course, a minimalist sculpture is not interested in the kinds of meanings that Vivan Sundrum is imputing to it. I mean, a minimalist sculpture is all about the kind of phenomenological encounter with the body, uh, etc. Whereas uh, that aspect is retained here because normally you go through these barricades, at least in one of its earlier iterations, uh, but he's, it's also interested in functioning as something else. Uh, you know. And so this is a, a strategy which he's adopted in many of, his, uh, his subsequent works, but it particularly comes to the fore in this work because certainly now, for example, when you look behind this marble slab, which is kind of sort of uh, a steel or a, or a kind of sort of uh, cenotaph-like uh, 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 slab, it's behind it is this sort of plastic cast of of a, of a model of a man on the st lying on the, on, on the ground, which is again referring back to this photograph of, of this dead man on the street. But of course it's made in plaster, it then re refers inevitably to someone who's aware art historically, to George Siegel's sort of plaster cast figures, just as you know these neon lights here obviously refer to Dan Flavin, etc. I'm not, I'm, I'm enumerating these examples, not to say that, that that's that once you get these references that the work is consumed or, or one has understood it. I'm just saying that the strategies of, as an allegorist in Vivan Sundrum's work is precisely to, to revisit, to reappropriate uh, certain, th certain elements uh, and give them new meanings. <clears throat> so I'm going to go very quickly through, through this installation, which you can see it's now going to be, it's, it's there for some time to come, which is, gives one, you know, other people to come and see it as well. But, you know, it leads, this pathway leads to this sort of um, gateway-like structure, which again is being ironic about the kind of grandiose uh, structures which we see, you know, uh, as, sort of, as sort of heraldic uh, uh, um, entrances to monuments, which here in this case are composed of, I thought I had an image of that, of sort of, you know, rusted, uh, tins used by poor people to keep their, 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 their things. So it's become a kind of sort of piled one on top of the other. They, be, they can constitute a kind of uh, monument which is sort of really, uh, uh, a monument which is really ironic about its, its monument, monumentality. <clears throat> Um, now this again, I, I mean, the whole installation is conceived as sort of various stations in a kind of passage. And of course, each time, or very often, it's the figure of this dead man which has been, you know, uh, uh, revisited. Sometimes, you know, in very different ways. Uh, uh, like here, for example, the image is screened by thousands of nails, which have been nailed, literally nailed into the image. Or you have uh, nails which some which sheathes the image, as the title has it. Uh, incidentally, this is the, the photograph initially, which appeared in the newspaper showed uh, this dead body against this overturned garbage container. But when you see it in this way, the garbage container, even in the original photograph, it looks, because it's been overturned, it looks like some kind of modernist sculpture, curiously enough. Uh, um, so, you know, so there are all, kind, all kinds of associations at play, but basically in this work, which is a kind of work of mourning, uh, work of mourning at the kind of secular pact that has been broken in India, which continues to be broken, um, and I mean, it's accelerating in, in dangerous ways now. Uh, but it starts, all starts in 1993. And I might remind you that the, this pogrom began in the state of Gujarat, and the prime minister, of, of the chief minister of that state is currently India's prime minister. Uh, and nothing was done at the time to prevent this atrocity from happening. Uh, that said, I get back to this image, uh, which declines this image of the fallen man in very different ways. It's referring to, I mean, you know, it's very sort of burial rites, so to speak. I mean, various different ways of, of, of 
giving the man uh, some kind of burial, uh, which is basically you know the the way it, it sort of varied from one object um, to to the other in, in 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 this installation. And when you come out of this, ins you know at the back it says "fallen mortal," and then you have the sort of graffiti like. Uh, drawings on these tin suitcases which obviously refer to sort of you know signs of utopian signs that you go with Van syndrome, the hammer and the sickle, etc. It refers to workers and peasants, rebellions, etc. etc. So, um, I should have to quote it rather quickly. Uh, but I just show you these images which you can all see in the real in this uh, in the exhibition. Uh, this is really the original image you, know, uh, you can see here. Okay, and of course, I mean, there are later additions to this. This work initially was done in 1993. Then it, there, were, there were other uh, iterations and they, other items added to it. You have, for example, here a tar, which obviously is referring to Rochenko or Tatlin in some other places. Um, it's also reviewing sort of various emblematic forms we associated with modernist architecture, um, et cetera. <clears throat> I want to come to another image, uh, another work, which was done a year later. And I show this because just to suggest that uh, Vivan Sundaram is also, from this moment onwards, interested in using materials which are rather fragile or, uh, or vulnerable. This is a shed made out of handmade paper. Incidentally, this handmade paper comes from, uh, uh, from Gujarat, where Gandhi, you know, it's called, it's made out of khadi, which is sort of the emblematic Indian cotton by excellence because it was used by Gandhi during the freedom struggle to protest against the kind of cheap imported cotton which is coming from Britain to India and therefore ruining the local Indian industries. So khadi has a very long history in India. It's, very, it's a very emblematic material. It's here used as paper, which Vivan Sunam has made, out of which has made this sort of uh, rather rudimentary sculpt, uh, shelter. Uh, he says somewhere that in fact it was inspired by a kind of shelter for those fleeing from you know, rampant mobs on the street. And what you see inside is really uh, a dish with water in it, but a video image in it, in, in, you know, in that reflecting surface is of, uh, is of something burning. So again, a, a kind of paradoxical image of a shelter, which is also potentially where one can, it's a, a kind of hearth, but which is also um, it, it's also not, not sort of uh, exempt from, 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 from menace or danger. Um, but this is the kind of sort of, um, the kind of fragile or delicacy of, of materials that he uses. It also has obviously uh, a, um, an ideological and a phenomenological uh, point to make. Uh, it's, it's about, it, I mean, that the kind of glancing references to Arte Povera, not because Arte Povera is about poor materials, as, as the title we see and suggests, but more in terms of using materials in a hybrid kind of way and also emphasizing the work of the hand, of something artisanal. And I think that's one thing I was very interested in more and more as a kind of counter to, let's say, the impersonal, minimalist uh, sculptural objects, which, you know, obviously disdain any trace of the hand. I also want to show this beautiful work called A River Car Car Carried This Pass, which again exemplifies what I've just said. Sorry, I'm going away from the mic. I hope you can hear me. Um, uh, which is again a kind of riverscape. It was made by his artisan residence in, in, in Britain uh, in 1991 uh, at a place which is still famous for its shipbuilding industry, but gradually on the decline. So this sort of kind of burnt paper uh, with these trays on the floor which contain oil. I mean, it's obviously in a very compact and poetic way referring to this shipbuilding industry which initially in its colonial times was used precisely to make ships which sailed to all the colonies to get back all kinds of goods back to, to the empire. So it's referring to all these things but in a rather sort of very condensed and economical way. And of course, in the kind of sort of the beauty of the charred, uh, stained, um, handmade paper contributes to this effect of something which is, you know, slowly, uh, this kind of clear, light and clear effect uh, uh, of, of something which is sort of slightly rusted and going to seed, going to decay. 
And just one work from the extensive, I mean, the two sets of drawings that we showed in the exhibition to suggest how uh, I talked about installation, which is a mode which Van Sundaram first explores in 1993, but how already there is a move towards, to move away from the wall as, as a template, and how, you know, a drawing like this, which is partly uh, of a series which, ex which treats of the first uh, Gulf War uh, in Iraq, uh, where, of course, the main objective was really about petrol, and so this tray on the ground which contains engine oil, uh, uh, I, and behind it, of course, this sort of image of this kind of maelstrom of bombing, bombs dropping, missiles dropping, etc. I was also interested in showing how there is this gradual move away from, from the frame of painting to an expanded space, uh, as in, for example, this work, a later work of, called 12 Bed Ward, which again is, exemplifies the kind of fellow feeling that Vivan Sundaram has for uh, menial trades, like, you know, the person, like rack pickers who go barefoot in the streets to pick up whatever is on rubbish they can find on the streets, which they then sell for a paltry sum. Uh, how he's created this ward as a kind of sort of uh, temporary shelter for them. And of course, the, the beds in question are made of the very souls. I mean, these are rack pickers who've been told to go out and find shoes which have been thrown away in, you know, as rubbish, uh, which are then recuperated and then scalped, and then the rubber is then reused for something else. So these beds are made out of these discarded soles of shoes. Uh, so there's a kind of sort of irony that those who go out looking for these souls are now being given a kind of shelter made precisely from those souls. You know? So uh, it's a very sort of, it's uh, a work which obviously I think probably has its closest links with Arte Povera in terms of its sort of uh, austerity in terms of its sort of the way, uh, with very simple means, I mean, he creates this rather sort of theatrical uh, installation. I mean, one thinks vaguely of Cornelis, but, you know, uh, Vivan Sundaram, by the way, is not at all afraid of, of uh, appropriating or uh, ingesting or transforming the work of his contemporaries. Uh, uh, in, uh, you know, so, I'm not saying that he looked at Cornelis specifically, but there is a kind of, uh, I, I think, uh, affinity with uh, some of Cornelis' work in, 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 in this particular uh, installation by, by Vivan. <clears throat> I then moved to a work with a different flavor. It's called Great Indian Bazaar, and uh, it, it's, it's a piece with what I just said about the interest in, in scavenging uh, things which have been discarded. And, Great Indian Bazaar, obviously the very title is obviously a kind of ironic reference to what one thinks about when you, when you just think about the Great Indian Bazaar as some kind of exotic souk or market where you find all kinds of exotic wares. Whereas here, in fact, these are hundreds of images, photographs taken by Vivan Sundar himself of these Sunday markets which uh, on the pavements of Delhi, uh, which sell things which nobody really wants anymore. So, you know, they're sort of really bric-a-brac of the most varied kind. And so they, this pile of images, you know, this heap of images becomes this sort of great uh, Indian bazaar, and it's, it points to Vivan Sundaram's increasing interest in, in recycling, in, in ecological issues, in waste. This is another part of that same series called Great in, uh, in, Indian Bazaar, but these are framed images, and you can see the kind of sort of really odds and ends which are up for sale in these, in these markets. I mean, there are no sort of exotic wares or lucky finds for the, you know, for the, for the estate uh, in, in a flea market. They're not flea markets, they're just basically stuff or junk which nobody wants anymore, you know. Which again, I think is obviously referring in a subtle way to the kind of whole ideology of waste and about uh, bringing up ecological issues, but also the whole idea about dumping and about, you know, uh, uh, obsolescence, uh, uh, among other motifs. <clears throat> And now we come to uh, a set of works which, again, is, is not far from the sole preoccupation with uh, imagining a cityscape composed entirely of discarded stuff. You know? uh, and so you have these rather large-scale digitally com um, 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 uh, 
composed works, which uh, are these huge maquettes, you know, which we once known then photographs. Uh, but what is strange, I mean, there's a whole paradox involved here because they are maquettes, and normally an, arch uh, an architect's maquettes are projects for something which is, uh, which are, which is going to make something new, something which is going to change people's lives. But here, of course, the maquettes are made with all kinds of discarded rubbish. You know? So it's also obviously a metaphor the way, certainly in India, the ur urbanization has gone haywire, where the way the cities are choking, the pollution, etc. I don't want to suggest when I bring up these themes that Van Sundaram is actually illustrating these, these issues. Uh, I'm, I, just, I mean, I bring them up as shorthand because you would have noticed that in each case there is a real concern for how the f of finding the, the the form adequate to what he wants to say, and so, so which obviously means a great sensitivity to the kinds of materials he uses, um, including in this case uh, recourse to sort of digital photography. <clears throat> I'm coming towards the end. I think I'm am I okay? <laughs> um, which I wanted to contrast with um, the video which you see uh, in the exhibition. It's called Black Gold, uh, a rather different, a very different register, probably rather more poetic uh, in a different way. Uh, it is uh, inspired by an installation which Vivan Sundrum did at the Kochi Biennale uh, um, in 2012. Uh, and this is the video uh, version of it, so to speak. Uh, Kochi is now well, becoming to well, be well known because it's, it hosts the Kochi Biennale. But it's also in antiquity, a very, it was a very famous uh, site, um, an archaeological, and I mean, we have these hundreds of archaeological remains of potsherds from it. But also Kochi was later on in the 16th century onwards, a great trading port and certainly famous for its spices and certainly famous for pepper, which used to be called black gold. So here, because it was, a spy, it was an installation in Kochi, Vivan Sundaram was referring to the history of, of the place, uh, but the video of, obviously has an independent life of its own, because what he's done here is to assemble thousands of potsherds, which were lent to him by the archaeological department of that region, uh, which in this particular place have been sort of inundated with water, and thousands of peppercorns have been floated in it. So the cumulative effect is, and of course it's a, it's a, it's a video projection which, I mean, which is, uh, keeps shifting, I mean, the, 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 the views of this, this sort of uh, aqueous mass. Uh, and so what you see very uh, uh, sort of strange formations which, which recall, you know, like coral or, you know, uh, um, all kinds of sort of strange uh, aquatic uh, uh, forms, but it's also, despite the kind of rather contemplative tenor of the work, it's also a kind of sort of, uh, it suggests a kind of aqua alta, a kind of sort of, 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 of something t more tidal stirring. I mean, incidentally, the ancient city of Kochi, which was called Musuris, was swept away by a tsunami, you know, uh, 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 probably, you know, uh, 10th century. Uh, so, but as always with Ivan, this whole idea of some kind of uh, uh, turbulence under the surface uh, is is one of, is, is, is recurrent. And obviously this work, among other things, is, however abstract it might seem, is a kind of sort of uh, idea about some kind of tidal wave, uh, coming towards India, not specifically in terms of, of climate, but more in terms of the way the country is now on the verge of some kind of explosion. Uh, but that's just suggested or barely hinted at, because what we see is this sort of, uh, uh, the, the kind of, a kind of field of ruins, uh, um, you know, I'm talking about obviously black gold, which I want to juxtapose as uh, to, uh, now with uh, another work which again uses Terracotta, but this is terracotta made by by students, by young artists who Vivan Sundaram engaged in a collective project. Um, it's called One and the Many, uh, and it's it's basically a homage to an important modern figure, uh, important figure in the history of modern Indian art, uh, a sculptor called Ram Kinkar, um, whom Vivan Sundaram particularly admires. He was someone who taught at Shantiniketan uh, near Calcutta, the university which was founded by Tagore. 
And um, what the Man Syndrome has done here is ask uh, these young artists who are just out of art school to freely interpret certain emblematic sculptures of Ram Kinkar. Ram Kinkar was someone who was very close to the, to the tribals, or what now we would call indigenous people, um, and made monumental sculptures as, hom as a kind of, you know, in, as, 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 a, as a way of homage to them. And so these are small terracotta figures which have been, I mean, they're, I think, more than 400, I think, um, um, uh, which have been placed in this sort of descending order. And one of the images that Vivan Sundram had in mind was this famous scene from Battleship Potemkin when, you know, when this whole, the mass of people are, of, you know, come tumbling down these, uh, the, the stairs. And he wanted that kind of sort of uh, chaos to be suggested by these, uh, by these figures. Uh, um, this is just an aspect which I, I shall go into greater detail about the kind of collaborative projects that Vivan Sundram often has. Uh, uh, he's very interested in engaging uh, uh, um, uh, or doing projects with pe where many people are involved. And in fact, the larger project in this case was also a theater project involved, it, it, it involved you know, um, theater, musicians, dancers, but what we show here is basically these sculptural works. I just want to sort of tell you, uh, recall, the kind of work which Ram Kinkerbej, the artist in question, did. This is a work from 1956, installed out in the open in Shantaniketan, the grounds of this university. You can see, obviously, that it's it's a kind of uh, sculpture which is which is a, a, in a kind of heroic mode, uh, exalting you know uh, workers and peasants. Uh, uh, mill recall being people who being the siren from the mill is calling them to work. Uh, a work made in 1956. Uh, which Vivan Sundram reinterprets here as mill recall using uh, exclusively, you know, discarded motor parts. Ram Kinkar, incidentally, was apparently a great, uh, um, was fascinated by speed, and so uh, Vivan Sundram decided to use this, make this sculpture, which is a sort of bricolage by excellence, uh, using exclusively used motor parts. And there are these twin figures, one of them is looking forward, the other looking behind, as, as an in this sculpture, which you know, which uh, which is obviously in a very different medium, uh, so it's a kind of homage to an older figure uh, of Indian art, a homage also to the kind of sort of utopian uh, um, promise or utopian hope of this older figure, uh, which Vivan Sundram clearly shares himself. Uh, uh, just as another work by the same artist called Thresher, uh, which Vivan Sundram has transposed rather ingeniously as plough, and you can see that you know, this figure in question is made entirely of, of, of the very ordinary sort of resistant plastic tube, which has been twisted to assume the shape of this, of this figure manipulating this plough, uh, which the origin here is called thresher, which is actually in cement. And therefore, but I want to end on a more sort of buoyant note, uh, and I show you uh, this video uh, called The Brief Ascension of Marin Hussein. It goes back to the one who was interested in, in discarded material, in rubbish, in waste, uh, and it goes back to the whole idea of the rack picker, the young, young boys who, who you know, roam the streets uh, looking for, you know, People, things that people have thrown away in order to, be, to sell them for a very modest price. So here, of course, it's a kind of tableau that he's created because what you see, in fact, is f it have to go down. You have to go from the bottom to the top. So you see this mound, misshapen mound of clothes, of discarded, you know, whatever rubbish, uh, pe with people walking across it over here, and then gradually. Uh, you see this mount moving or shifting, and then you gradually notice that there's actually a figure who's been sleeping there or reclining there or taking shelter there, emerging, stretching his arms, and as if in a moment of magical thinking, levitating from this, this mount of rubbish, as if sort of freeing himself from this mountainous detritus. Uh, and then of course, Loop, the video loops, loops back. So I think in this kind of ascension, this kind of this idea of actually f projecting some, a, a, a kind of projection to another domain uh, is the kind of sort of utopian potential that Vivan Sundar would like his art uh, to have or to suggest. Uh, and I think I'll render that. So. Thank you.